So let me just say that uh, many of you might wonder what an economist journalist does. And what I do is I basically spend my life reading books. And I was reading a book many years ago called Capitalism for the People. And I thought, this is, this is just really one hell of a great book. And I wanted to meet the author. And that's how I met the next speaker, Luigi Zangales. He has a new book, Capitalism for the People. And he really addresses the question that was raised by this person over here in the last session about regulatory capture and cronyism and so forth. He's one of the most distinguished professors at the University of Chicago's Booth Business School. And I'm really delighted to have him come here. Um, so Luigi, why don't you just come out? He's going to speak for 10 minutes. Um, I, I think you should really attack him with the toughest questions you can, because he's a person who can answer them. So thank you very much. Please, Luigi. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Uh, as my name and accent uh, give away, I'm Italian, and uh, so I know a few things about chronic capitalism. And uh, <laughs> what my book is about is actually my fear uh, that the United States uh, is degenerating into an Italian form of chronic capitalism. And uh, to give you a sense of where this sort of degeneration came from and how dangerous it is, I want to give you the example of this vicious spiral with an example that comes from uh, 2009. If you remember, in uh, March 2009, US Congress voted a 100% tax rate on bank bonuses. This never became law because the Senate knew better than pass it, but it was an indication of how sort of uh, strong was this populist uh, uh, uprise and how this translates into infringing property rights. Because no matter what you think about uh, uh, the way banks were managed, uh, a 100% tax rate is expropriation. It's not taxation, it's expropriation. And uh, at the very same time in which this was happening, uh, the Obama administration was creating a public-private investment partnership that was actually heavily subsidizing financial firms to buy toxic assets. And my estimates were suggesting that they were getting like $2 of subsidy per dollar of investment. So a gigantic subsidy. And what was the justification of that subsidy? The justification was we fear that if we invest now and we lose, we lose our money. If we invest now and we gain, we're going to be expropriated, exposed. And so we don't invest unless we have some form of subsidy from the government. So the, we, the problem is that the populist outrage generates the need for some privileges and some subsidies. But those privileges and those subsidies, of course, generate more populist outrage. And this is a vicious circle from which it's very difficult to get out. And the reason why this circle has started now in the United States is because the free market system that was working so well here and created so much consensus is under threat. It's under threat for many reasons that have been discussed at these sort of sessions uh, throughout the two days. In part is because the growth has gone down. In part is because the inequality has gone up. But also in part because the sense of fairness has disappeared. As an Italian coming to this country, I was surprised how much people actually trust government. The first time I saw sort of uh, I experienced a tornado watch in uh, uh, Boston, uh, I was shocked that not only the mayor was giving directions of what to do, that's very unusual in Italy, but also the fact <laughs> people were following those directions. So the direction was you have to stay inside and you have to tape all the windows. And being Italian, the first reaction was it must be that the mayor's brother is selling tape. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the fact that people were actually following that was, was stunning. And I think that that is the great thing about this country, this thing is disappearing. Because uh, in, in, a, in a survey I did in, at the end of 2008, 50% of the respondent thought that Hank Paulson was acting in the interest of Goldman Sachs and not in the interest of the country. And six months later, I asked similar questions vis-a-vis -vis the Obama administration. And the only thing, the only difference was that the majority was divided whether it was acting in the interest of the financial industry or in the interest of the unions. What the majority was convinced was not that they were not acting in the interest of the American people at large. So we are really at a turning point. Populism, I think, is inevitable. And then the question is, 
what form of populism, where we go in what direction. And here I sort of uh, make a, a bet and I say, can we try to use this sort of populism and direct in a way so that it destroys the crony part of capitalism rather than capitalism itself? And the first rule for this to happen is we need to make it clear to the vast public that there is a big difference between being pro-market and being pro-business. Businessmen, like free markets, when they enter a new industry, the moment they are in, they want to increase the buyer to entry and make profits. If you are pro-markets, you are pro-free markets both before and after. And I think that's an important distinction that most people miss. And even in the public debate, uh, the question is whether sort of uh, who is more pro-business, i.e. who is catering to the interest of large corporation more between the two parties that are facing the election. It's not who is more pro-market to create the best conditions for Americans to flourish. And so in my book, I have a number of proposals that I don't have time to uh, elaborate on. But what I want to tell you is what I don't do and this, the philosophy of what I do do. So what I don't do is go in the direction of more redistribution. First of all, because that doesn't work. Second, because that will scare away the most talented that have flocked to America over the centuries. So we don't want to kill uh, the, the, the smart immigrants who are creating the success of America. We don't want to sort of discourage them from, from coming here. So how do you create sort of a, a more buying in uh, without doing more distribution? And the answer is you rely more on free markets and you create better opportunities. So one thing that many people have discussed here is how to improve sort of primary and secondary education. And in my book, I explain how you can do it via the market, uh, adapting an old idea of a Milton Friedman on voucher, but making vouchers sort of contingent on uh, the education of your parents so that disadvantaged kids have vouchers who are worth more and schools are looking for to educate the disadvantage because that's a more profitable opportunity. The second point is how to sort of uh, limit regulatory capture, which I think is the key issue because markets do need rules. Without rules, they don't function, they become a jungle. And in the jungle, the strongest win, not the most efficient. Uh, but I do know that rules tend to be captured by the industry that are supposed to uh, regulate. And so my uh, uh, solution is twofold. Is number one, have very simple rules, so simple that even congressmen can understand them. And, and, <laughs> it's, and it's not a joke, because Nancy Pelosi, when she passed sort of Obamacare, she said, we need to pass it to find out what is in it, which I think is pretty scary. But the second point, and, and I think Palmisano made that point in some form, is we need sort of data to make regulators accountable. A, a colleague of mine teamed up with some Federal Reserve employees and actually documented how bad state regulators are in making the famous camel rating. And he went through an enormous amount of harassment because the Fed does not want to release those data. I think the only way to make regulators not be captured is to make them accountable. And the only way to make them accountable is to have data on their performance readily available for anybody to analyze. And you know, some data are confidential at the moment. So I understand you don't want to sort of release the camel rating, this rating about the solidity of a bank immediately. But there is no justification on earth why those ratings cannot be made available three or four years down the line. The only justification is the regulators don't want to be accountable. And that's exactly the reason why we want them accountable. And the last point is, I think that the reform starts from business school themselves. Because we have been a bit too cavalier in saying that anything goes and not relying on any social norm. Uh, as scientists, we are afraid of even talking about social norms. But we're not scientists, we're social scientists. And you know, physicists don't teach atoms how they behave. We teach businessmen how the world works. And when we sort of teach, uh, we inevitably take a stand. 
A French philosopher was saying, you cannot not choose because not choosing is choosing not to choose. And the same is true for social norms. When you don't take a position, you are taking position, and that position is very subtle, uh, and most people don't understand, but nevertheless has a strong in, uh, influence. So when we say that it's rational to commit a crime when the expected benefits is bigger than the expected cost, we indirectly are saying it is irrational not to commit a crime when the expected benefits is bigger than the expected cost. And irrational is generally not a good term, and people don't like to be irrational. So I think that we need to reintroduce in our classes, not as a separate class. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in Italy where we had a separate class of religion, and that class of religion made more atheists than anything else. Uh, so I don't want a separate class on ethics. I want sort of social norms brought into class, into regular classes, or what it is good business and bad business, not from the point of view of some abstract morality, I'm not a moral philosopher, but from the point of view of the market itself. Uh, having a huge amount of lobbying uh, and capturing the regulator is not something that is good for the market long term. And we should tell our students that that's bad behavior. I don't think it's easy to regulate, but precisely because it's not easy to regulate, we have to have the courage of standing up and say that is wrong. It's wrong from a market perspective. After all, business schools will only survive if the free market system will survive. So we have a vested interest in preserving the good market system for the long term. Thank you. Can we get um, the lights up if we can? Um, questions, please. Yeah, there's a question here, but I, please raise your hand so I know how to work the, the room. So if you have any thoughts, just raise your hand so I know that you're there. Um, let's begin with you. Transparency uh, for regulators is, is obviously good, but how would you protect them from the Tea Party? Why, would you need to? Uh, why you need to protect them from the Tea Party? I think that the Tea Party interprets a, a sense of resentment which is common uh, in a large fraction of the American population. I think that the Tea Party and the Occupy movement are not that far away. They're both fighting two sides of the same coin. The Tea Party is fighting against an overly intrusive government. The Occupy movement is fighting overly intrusive big business. The problem, of course, is the intermingling between big business and big government. And until we understand that, I think we cannot find a solution. It's an excellent question. Yeah, please. Uh, Michael Green with Canyon Partners. Um, two, two quick questions slash observations. The first is you highlight the idea of accountability for regulators. How do you, how do you even think something like that can work? I live in New York State where we can't even get public teachers' performance records put out into the public domain. Right? It's incredibly difficult to push something like this through. And then the second point that I would make is to your observation about ethics within business schools, empirically we have evidence that regulatory capture and excessive lobbying pays. There are any number of firms that have done academic research in terms of the amount of regulatory spending and how firms that spend more from a, from a lobbying standpoint outperform in the public markets. How would you address something like that in, in terms of a, a business professor saying, you know, well, crime doesn't pay, but it clearly does. So let's just, because in journalism they say you should never ask two questions because they just may choose. Let's just break those up. Question number one is given the challenges in the political system, how do you get this through? And question number two is how do you reverse the economics given that capture pays? So, so number one, I have a chapter in the book that's called Data to the People. And I think that uh, uh, the there should be an objective of any movement with these ideas to make it a priority that all the data should be available uh, at least with a delay. Uh, and if we don't do that, I don't think we can make any progress. So I think that, uh, of course, the uh, public f will fight it back. But as Palmisano was saying, today is more difficult not to have the data than to have them. They are automatically recorded and uh, it's very hard to resist uh, a popular pressure to have them disclosed. So uh, I think that 
one goal of my book is to try to create this pressure to make the regulators uh, accountable. Uh, on the return to lobbying, I think that the return to lobbying is gigantic. And um, Gordon Tallock has made this point many, many years ago, and despite sort of the increase in, in uh, campaign financing, this point is still true. <laughs> However, I think that what we need to teach as business school professor is what are the long-term consequences of having this power. And an example that makes me not particularly popular in Italy, but I say, you know, the reason why nepotism was invented in Rome by the Catholic Church is because the Catholic Church was basically owning the government and preventing competition. Uh, Giordano Bruno was burned in Campo dei Fiori because it was competition. And that monopolistic attitude uh, has allowed popes over the history to appoint their nephews or their children in important position. Uh, in the United States, where people compete, in the, in the Protestant churches they compete, you cannot appoint an idiot as minister of a church because that church will disappear. And what is the result is today, many more people go to church in the United States than in Italy because long-term competition keeps the organization alive and monopoly destroy them. So if we care about the long-term survival of business, not just the profits that you do tomorrow, we care about keeping those business healthy, and the way you keep them healthy is to keep them in a competitive environment. We may have time for one very brief question. Is there a, if there isn't, uh, what do your uh, fellow faculty members in, say about these ideas, are they? <laughs> I think that... Uh, uh, Especially about in business school, as you said, changing the... Uh... I think that they are a bit uh, uh, shocked by this uh, ethic dimension. I think they buy most of the rest of the book. I think this one is sort of uh, the thing that uh, is probably most novel for them. Uh, but they need to be educated. They need to be educated. All right, well, I want to say one thing. We're, we're out of time, but um, as many of you know, um, America's financial system and its, and its glories were basically created by immigrants Morris, Hamilton, Gallatin. It's not unprecedented for America to look overseas to get ideas from people who often came from very flawed places themselves. If there's one point from, that uh, Luigi makes that I think is just unbelievably powerful and should, should just come up again and again and again is this distinction between what is pro-business and what is pro-market. Many, many on both the business side and on the political side, when they say they are actually pro-capitalist, are actually pro-business. They are not pro-market, and therefore they create a corrosive system. And I think that that, you know, it was touched upon in his initial book on um, capitalism, and, and on his second book, it's really hammered home that much more. And I think that should be part of all of our discussions and of The Economist itself. Anyway, buttonhole. Ms. Uh, Mr. Zingales afterwards, and, and our, we have no time left on this panel, but thank you very much, and thank you very much in particular for those questions over here.